Ready to go to work, June? Yes, see if you can join. We'll uh, call the meeting to order. And we'll go on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight we'll, we'll be led by uh, Council Member Grossman. Council. Join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Marty. Okay, we uh, move on to roll call. June. Okay, Councilmember Bernie. Here. Councilmember Whiting. Here. Councilmember Mallory. Here. Vice Mayor Nye. Here. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Grossman. Still here. And Mayor Skoog. Be present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you, June. Okay, we move on to the scheduled announcements and presentations. A, Sergeant Promotions Chief. Evening, Mayor, members of council. Mayor, are you going to join me to do the uh, swearing in? We'll do it. John? So while you're making your way down here, Mayor, um, so we're here tonight to recognize Sean Caswell and his promotion to sergeant. Sean began his career with the Prescott Valley Police Department in August of 2000. He started in the patrol division, as does everybody, and has held numerous certifications during his 17 years of service to include firearms instructor, rifle instructor, precision rifle instructor, level two accident reconstruction specialist, and hostage rescue. Sean was promoted to corporal in January of 2009 and was ultimately assigned to the traffic section as a motor corporal and also became the SWAT team leader. Sergeant Caswell has received several department awards to include a police star for bravery in 2011, officer of the year in 2004, and three separate life savings life saving awards in 2013. When he's off duty, Sean spends most of his time mountain biking, fishing, doing archery, precision shooting, and drag racing with his daughters, Paige and Elena. I offer to you the newly promoted Sergeant Sean Caswell. Sean Caswell do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the laws of the state of Arizona. That I will bear true witness and allegiance to, do, to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the Office of Police Sergeant for the town of Prescott Valley according to the best of my ability, so help me God. Congratulations and thank you for your service. His father is here. Come on up. His daughters are here too. Uh, Twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just a key one. No, I'm just very proud of him. He's a fine young man. the tricky part. So 
Boy, some, uh, some guys are awful sensitive about needles. Yeah, I'm not real fond of them. Vice Mayor, comment? Did my ears hear drag racing? <gasps> <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> you just went up in my opinion. This is a proud day for you, <clears throat> and it's a happy day for us on, on our council. Uh, we're very invested in all of you, and we're very concerned about the safety of our community. But when we see these promotions, we know we have very little to worry about. So I do want to congratulate you and thank you for all of the deeds that you're now going to have to deal with that you didn't have to deal with before. Council Member Mallory. Mary? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Yes, congratulations. And uh, like always, we appreciate everything that you do. And um, we couldn't ask for better service from such a wonderful police department. We are blessed here, and we support you and all of you with everything we've got. Well, congratulations. I think uh, I'm always uh, excited to see uh, promotions because I, I know we've seen you and others move up through the ranks and I think that's anticipated, expected. And I think the uh, culture of our police department uh, provides you, I think, the basis and the opportunity to move up. And when you're a, a sergeant now, I think uh, you have the expertise we expect you to have to lead and uh, lead uh, the, the department as well. So we, we appreciate your commitment in stepping up, and congratulations. Jody? Sergeant, I want to piggyback on Council Member Whiting's comments about leading and you taking under your wing those that are coming up after you. Thank you, because I know that you'll do that. And I do want to ask, uh, is that the first time your dad has ever stuck you with a pen? <laughs> with the sheriff's office, too. Very good. Well, it probably, it probably won't be the last time, I would imagine. Marty? Yeah, congratulations, uh, Sergeant Caswell. Uh, it's it's a it's always great to have a promotion ceremony before the council and before the community and the public. Uh, it just goes to show the talent that we have here that we're able to promote constantly uh, the officers as they move up through the ranks. Uh, you've put in 17 years. You have a, a wide variety of. Uh, experience within the police department in different capacities. So that's going to mean a lot in your new role as sergeant because I know there's a lot more paperwork now that you have to do and there's a little more responsibility. So, and uh, so congratulations. And if I'm not mistaken, did I notice that you have your daughters out here? Are these your daughters? Yeah, they're up here. <laughs> How come, uh, Congratulations, yeah, now I've embarrassed them, so blame it on me. <laughs> How about uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Caswell? I'm, I know Mr. I got uh, cold feet and sat down. Uh, Anderson, Rick? Yes. You know, I want to congratulate you for everything you've done for this town for the last 17 years that's brought you to this point tonight. Uh, it's not an easy process. Uh, it never is, uh, but congratulations for everything you've accomplished thus far in your career, and we look forward to many more years from you, and you do have a wonderful-looking family, so thank you. Thank you, Rick. You're next. I am very happy for my dad because he has taught me a lot about self-confidence and I'm happy that he's doing this for his city and helping us with it also. So I'm very proud of him today. <laughs> Chief, Chief, another comment? You're, you're last, by the way. <laughs> um, I'd like to say thank you. Um, as uh, many of you know, that uh, my past over the last couple of years, um, I would like to take a, a minute to thank my family. 
um, the police department in the town in the community that all came together to help me to get through what I went through last year and I'm very thankful for it thank you you along with the police department are doing a super job we've got a great department our crime rate is one of the lowest in the state or more important our safety community safety rate is one of the highest in the state so we appreciate that anything else Thank you, Chris. Congratulations. Good job. <laughs> One more, Chief. Can I? Thank Thank you. Okay, one more. Okay, next we have uh, Sheriff Scott Masher. Sheriff, you're up. Thank you, Mayor. Good to see you. Huh? Well, thank you all for uh, having me today. I'll just take a few moments. Um, I just wanted to come by and thank the town of Prescott Valley and even more importantly thank the Prescott Valley Police Department and their staff for the assistance on the, the Goodwin fire. Uh, I, I think you all know how aggressive that fire was, how dangerous it was, and it involved so many communities. In, in Yavapai County, and we evacuated uh, almost 8,000 people from their residence. Uh, I can't tell you how many animals and horses and goats and things, and it, it was a huge logistical issue to go seven, eight, nine days and provide 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without having the assistance of the town of Prescott Valley. And to maintain those road closures, to maintain security in the residence where the folks had to be evacuated, that was a huge concern for all of those people. Uh, I know some of you came to the Incident Command Center and saw what was taking place there, and it truly was a crisis there Tuesday and Wednesday with it moving into Dewey Humboldt and Mayer and it looked like it was going to go clear into Wagner and into the city limits of Prescott. So there for a while it, it was uh, all hands on deck and I just wanted to personally come and say thank you for for your assistance on that. Uh, it took a lot of hours, a lot of people. Prescott Valley stepped up. Chief, thank you very, very much. Uh, and the staff that was out there, uh, thank you. I know the communities uh, noticed that. They noticed us work together. I think we have a great relationship with the sheriff's office and the local PD here, and I just wanted to personally come and say thank you all very much. It's, it's very much appreciated. Have a good day. Sheriff, thank you for your good job. <laughs> Barry, you got a comment? I, I was going to save it for the comments of communication, but 
Um, like the sheriff, I want to thank everyone who was involved in, you know, there were citizens that went way above and beyond. I'm aware of one instance where a rancher needed his um, horses and cattle rescued. And I'm aware of 23 citizens who bought their trailers, drove into the danger zone, and helped evacuate. And that was just one of the many stories of help and compassion that we saw happen. So I want to congratulate not only our first responders, but all those citizens. Some opened their homes, some provided comfort, some provided meals, and I'm very proud of our community, and I feel very fortunate to be a citizen here at Prescott Valley. Uh, Rick? I just wanted to say something before the sheriff got out of the building. I want to thank you personally for coming here tonight. Too often we get a letter in the mail thanking us for providing something to us. This is not the first time you've shown up in person to thank us for something or thank our department for something and that shows an awful lot to us and thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Sheriff, for your leadership. This was a real scare to all of us. And thankfully, it seemed like it's worked out okay. We're you know, I have a big heart for Preston Valley. You know what? We're going to ask you to use a microphone. It doesn't go over that. I was just going to say, you know, I think the world of Prescott Valley, I really do. The first house I ever bought was over here off Robert Road when it was just a dirt road, and I think you've heard me say that before. This town is taking the lead in Yavapai County, I think, in the growth and what is happening here in Yavapai County. I hope you're all proud of that. And anything that I can do with the sheriff's office to work with the city, work with the, the chief, I'll make sure I'm there for that. And uh, I enjoy coming here. I think it's important to continue the relationships that we have. And sorry, I'm dressed the way I am. I've been out in the field all day. Fortunately, I had the jacket in my, in my car. But uh, uh, I think we have a great relationship. God bless you guys, and thank you very much. Thank you again, Sheriff. Okay, with that we have uh, Chamber of Commerce. Is Marnie here? Cal, are you taking over tonight? <laughs> He's on the chamber business. Nobody from the chamber here tonight. Okay, we move on to number six. Comments, communications from the council. Anyone have any comments? You did? Any others? If there is none, then we move on to number seven. That's our uh, matters listed on their consent agenda. These are considered to be routine by the town council and will be enacted by one motion unless separate discussion of an item is desired. If this discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the agenda and will be considered separately. These include the uh, approving the June 15th work study session and the June 22nd, 7, 2017 council meetings. B is approving a series 12 liquor license for Native Grill and Wings located at 5533 East Highway 69, Amias Nations applicant. And that's a new business, by the way. C is a, 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 accepting $4,100 Community Foundation of Yavapai County, supporting law enforcement and canine fund. That's a grant. D is accepting or approving a resolution number 2006 adopting a revision to a town personnel policy, 210 uh, other short-term absences as recommended by the personnel board. E is a, a, a approving resolution number 2007, adopting updated uh, guidelines and authorizing submission of an application for state housing funds. E uh, rather, F is uh, approving revolutionary plat, revolutionary plat number RP17-006 to configure track D or TE and portions of track TF of the final plat of uh, Quellwood Meadows 
townhouses approved by July 14, 25 resolution 1367. G is approving rever reversionary plat to RP 17-007, combining Prescott Valley's Unit 5 lots 1742 and 1743A into a new lot 1743B for NACOG is establishing a Head Start preschool center in existing building on lot 1743B and wants to develop a playground on the adjacent lot number 1742. NH is approving a final plat dedication FP 17001 in order to dedicate property received as a gift from the Fane group as a right of way needed for widening of the Glassford, Glassford Hill Road, Long Look Intersection, CIP number 83, S379. I is approving the purchase of a contour rotary mower in the amount of $31,890.41, pursuant to an NJPA cooperative purchase contract number 070313, JCS from Textron Golf, J is approving acquisition of a Ramada from Ex Exer Play Incorporated, a landscape structure company via TCPN, certified proposal number R5202AZ, MB060917-1, in the amount of 28708 for Community Center Park. And K, that's at CASA. K is approving accounts payable. Anyone care to pull an item or do you want to actually? Mayor, make a motion to approve the consent agenda as a whole. I'll second that. Okay, the motion and a second. Would you set the vote, Diane? Yeah. June. Uh, June, I'm sorry. Councilmember Milley. Yes, yes. Mine didn't light up this time, June. And Mayor Skook, how do you wish to vote? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. And that passes. Thank you, June. We move on to uh, number eight. Oh, there we go. Okay. We move on to no business for review, comment, and or possible action. 8A, consideration of approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Humboldt Unified School District for the housing of virtual training simulator on Glassford Hill Middle School. Uh, Officer Louis, Ruiz. Lieutenant Mary Council. Council. Good evening. I would like to seek approval of an intergovernmental agreement between the Town of Prescott Valley and the Humboldt Unified School District for the housing of a virtual simulator. The Prescott Valley Police Department was recently awarded a virtual simulator on November 22nd, 2016 from the Arizona Department of Public Safety. The system is valued at $277,230. Uh, the system will be used to provide simulated training um, in firearms, uh, for the recruits at Northern Arizona, Northern Arizona Regional Training Academy and all Yavapai County agencies. During the acceptance stage, a secure facility that can accommodate the system was a requirement. Due to our continued partnership with the Humboldt Unified School District, Superintendent Dan Streeter offered a vacant classroom at the Glassford Hill Middle School at no cost to the Prescott Valley Police Department. The classroom was a perfect fit it did not cost the Prescott Valley Police Department any funds to modify the room. The system will be available to provide recruits at the Academy and Yavapai County agencies virtual training in firearms marksmanship, judgmental shooting scenarios, de-escalation skills, and a virtual training experience no other system can provide. With the system available to officers from the Prescott Valley Police Department, the community benefits because officers will be better trained to respond to high-risk critical calls or know how to communicate with someone to de-escalate a situation with a successful outcome. There will be no fiscal impact to the Town of Prescott Valley for the system. The maintenance and operational cost of the system will be funded by the Northern Arizona Regional Training Academy Board. Thank you for your consideration. Questions, anyone? Laura? I don't have a question, but I get so excited when these things happen. It doesn't surprise us anymore in our community because we have interesting and unique partnerships that even we ourselves 
don't understand the full ramification of the benefits. And I'm excited for, for everybody that's ever going to be able to walk into a simulator and learn and benefit. And I'm sure it's a point of pride for the school district to partner with you, and I want to congratulate both entities for working together and making this happen. Thank you. What's the time frame of the IGA? Uh, the, they uh, talked to the district today, and they're in the process of uh, just making minor modifications to it and then send it back by the end of the week. And the length of the agreement? Two years. That's going to be um, up until the point to where uh, we're going to be uh, moving the academy to the Prescott facility. And then we'll be, uh, the simulator will be moved at that time. Mary, you got a comment? Oh, I'm just going to echo off of Vice Mayor Nye's um, in regards to the fact that we work so well together as a community. And, uh, and we wouldn't be where we are today without the fact of us working together and helping each other and moving forward. It takes us all to get this community going, and, uh, and that's why we're here to support and help and move and go forward. So thank you again for everything. Thank you. Any other questions? Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to express my appreciation, the fact that we have a collaboration among uh, three entities, and I think it's a great partnership, and I look forward to uh, working with Humboldt uh, Unified School District uh, even in a greater uh, way, and I appreciate Dan Streeter opening up his classroom and actually having to modify it, and we thank NARDA as well. So looking forward to uh, that being put into implementation. Thank you. Any other comments? Are you ready for a motion? I think one question real quick. Did you mention that it has no fiscal impact on the town? Yeah. Yes, yeah. no fiscal impact on the town. Okay. Motion to approve the intergovernmental agreement between the town and HUSD by electronic and voice vote. Mr. Mayor, I'll second the motion. Okay, with a motion and a second, would you set the vote, June? And Councilmember Mallory? Yes. Thank you. And that passes, Mayor. Passes. Lieutenant, Thank go you. for it. Appreciate that. Good Thank job. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we move on to B, consideration of approving the submittal of grant application for U.S. Department of Just Justice, Department of Justice, uh, or DOJ, Office of uh, Community Ori Oriented Police Policing, also known as COPS. 2017 COPS hiring program, application for CEFDA 16.710, requiring a minimum of 463000 in matching federal no, funds. We Chief? All for him. Good evening again, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, before I talk about this, I did want to just take a moment to address uh, Sheriff Masher's comments earlier. And actually, it ties into the previous item on the Humboldt Unified School District IGA. A foundation for effective law enforcement starts with relationships, and the relationship that we have with not only our law enforcement partners throughout the county, but our non-law enforcement partners, such as the Humboldt Unified School District, really is what makes us so effective and able to do our jobs. And in regard to, as it relates to the um, Goodwin Fire, it's, it's nice, and I'm glad that the sheriff recognized not just me, but all of my staff who helped out, because i got to tell you, every employee of the police department, and I mean both sworn and non-sworn, stepped up into the plate. We went to 12-hour days to handle the emergency. We, we uh, were standing in the middle of intersections for hours on end directing traffic, especially when they closed 69 and 169, because that's our intersection. We had civilians calling our employees, keeping them up to date, especially the ones that might have been in affected areas. It was just a, a, a concerted effort by everybody involved, and I can't be more proud of the men and women who I work with every day. So I just wanted to say that for the record. Um, as far as the item before you tonight, this is a grant. Um, if, you, if we receive direction to proceed with the application and if we were awarded the grant, would provide for the funding of four officers for three years. Our match for those three years would total 460 some thousand dollars. Um, 
the, the, if we were awarded this grant, we would create a, a unit that would go out and address special concerns, especially the drug-related concerns that we're seeing that are escalating not only in our community but across the county. And uh, as we wrote this grant, one of the things that stood out to me is, um, number one, in June, I think it was, June 14th, the governor of the state issued a, an emergency declaration because of the opiate overdose problem. And in response to that, we have not been immune to that. And so we look back, and over the past year, in Prescott Valley alone, 333 drug-related arrests. And the fire department responded to over 87 possible overdoses from opiate use in Prescott Valley alone. And so we recognize that this is a problem that is, it is national, but is certainly not uh, absent from Yavapai County or Prescott Valley. And that was one of the main reasons why we wanted to apply for this grant. And with that, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Questions, Laura? Um, I do have a question, but I want to echo something you just said. I happened to be in a situation in a meeting yesterday where we were briefed by Pat on this topic. And we've already had over 30 deaths right here in Prescott. Valley from this. And the PAND officers, I, I've been privileged to meet with them many times over the years because of working with Map Force. And I saw how alarmed they were. They didn't even try to cover it up. And so your comments are really, really important. Thank you for making them. My question about this item. is, sorry, what is the plan for the officers when the grant is ended? If we were to receive this grant, we would create a special unit of four officers and a sergeant to supervise them. And they would do um, a multitude of things. They would identify high uh, usage areas through patterns and through statistical data driven where we're having the most problems. They would try to do, whether it's undercover buys or work with and alongside PANT, to uh, try to eradicate the problem specifically from Prescott Valley. So PANT is a countywide task force. This one would be specific only to Prescott Valley. We would also be involved heavily in education because pro the biggest problem is we're seeing a lot of this with our young, our young people in the community. So we would go into schools and other uh, venues to provide education on drugs and, and, and the seriousness of it. So it would be a, a multifaceted approach, if you will. But my question was, how do we keep them? What will happen to them when the grant is done? Oh, I'm sorry. That was a long answer for the wrong question. Um, so that was good. I'm glad you asked me that, actually, because traditionally I don't really like these kinds of grants because at the end of the grant period, in this case three years, we have a requirement to keep them for another year. And at the end of that one year, we could do whatever we want with them. We could keep them through attrition of others or whatever. But I believe as this town continues to grow, your police department is also going to have to grow. This is a great tool, if we get it, that provides for that growth now, and we don't have to pay for the whole thing. So three years with a one-year requirement at the end, so for a total of four years. Mary? Um, is there an opportunity for you when the grant's about to expire there to reach out and apply for it again? We could apply for another grant. I don't know if we could get an extension on this particular grant because it's only for a three-year cycle and it's to address a specific problem. I, I guess if that problem hasn't been addressed, they may say, well, maybe you didn't use the grant money properly. So I don't know. I don't think there's an extension possibility. Although a lot of times with federal grants especially, they, they have this pool of money and they divide it up and they give all these grant awards. But in, in some cases, all of that money is not always spent. And so then they reassess at the end of the grant period and say, we, well, we still have this much money available. How can we allocate that? And we may be able to get some of that if, if it were available. All right. It might be something that you could, you know, kind of take a look at and see where you sure. could go from here. Yep. Rick? Well, I wanted to emphasize something the chief just said, 
and that's that as the town grows, we're going to need more police officers. That's, that's a fact of life. And over the next four years, it's not unreasonable to believe that we're going to have to add four more police officers. And this is a relatively inexpensive way, relatively, because it's not going to cost us the full boat to add those police officers. Because four years from now, we're going to need four more cops. That's a fact of life probably more than four. So we're going to be looking at it in our budget process each year over the next four years and how we're going to add police officers. So I see this as a perfect opportunity to help us in that process and keep the cost down to the citizens of Prescott Valley. So I think it's a great idea. Um, but we have to understand our responsibility. You know, we, we added a lot of police officers when when that half cent sales tax went into effect, but there's going to be a need for more police officers over the years, and we're going to have to continue to add. So that's my two cents worth. Mary? And um, just to add to Councilmember Anderson's comment on the fact that, yes, we did add a half a cent tax to the community, and it's been well used and uh, We've been able to do well with the police department, and, and as he said, we are growing and we will continue to grow. And um, we need to be proactive toward the future. That was the whole point of what happened with the half a cent, is because we were actually behind. And uh, so going forward, uh, we need to, we understand where we've been, we know exactly where we're at, and we also have a better understanding of the future and how we're going to have to take care of it going forward. So I just uh, I appreciate his comment, and I think that um, we all have a clearer understanding of what we have to do. And I, I appreciate those comments, and I will tell you, and I've said it before, and I think it's worth noting again, in this police department, it's one of the most efficient that I've seen. We don't have sworn officers assigned to non-essential positions. When there's those types of positions available, we hire civilians for those, and we keep the, the sworn police officers uh, either on the street or in task forces or in the, the detective bureau investigating crimes or wherever the case may be, but we don't have people assigned to non-essential areas. Jody? Thank you, Mayor. Chief, I agree with uh, Council Member Anderson and, um, and Mallory that this is a good opportunity going into the future. Working on the federal side of the House, I'm always conservative uh, due to the additional expenses that come along with a federal contract. Therefore, I do want to ask about which fiscal year are you looking to usher into should we be able to receive the competitive grant and how are we going to handle the fringe benefits that are not covered in this? Well, I believe they, they do pick up fringe benefits and everything. It's a 60-40 split for the three years. When would we implement it? I believe awards come out in September or October of this year. So we would, I, I'm not sure I'd have to work that out with, with the town management to see how that would work with the, within the current budget year when you start adding positions that weren't normally accounted for. Sure, and that's where my concern is if we have not budgeted for that at Correct. this point, we need to take a look at that because the, you just even the first year is what, 148, 140,000 and some change, <coughs> basically. Correct, so, mm -hmm. but really it would only be half of that because we run a different fiscal year than the federal government. So if the award doesn't come out until November, even if we started to act and, and try to hire anybody, it probably wouldn't be until the beginning of our fiscal year, which then would be in a new budget year. Yes. Okay, thank you. Marty? Yeah, um, Chief, I think this, again, is a, is a great opportunity. And the, the other uh, benefit to having it where we might need another officer in four or five years, depending on how the, uh, the timing on this works, is normally when we get a brand new police officer out of the academy, they're basically lost to us for several months because they're in training. But if we have these trained officers, they could slide right into a, uh, to a slot and we don't have to use the training time of you know, several months to uh, break them in. So I think that's an added benefit to us, uh, both fiscally and uh, manpower-wise. 
So it, it's, it's a great program. I'm glad we're doing it. Well, just so I'm, we're clear, uh, if we were to get the grant and the, have the creation of the four, four new positions, I don't know how the positions would be filled, whether we could get lateral police officers from other areas. Um, then the learning curve is shortened significantly if they're already certified in the state of Arizona. Or even if they're not, if they're not certified in the state of Arizona, it's usually about a month so that they can um, study up and then challenge the Arizona test. And then once that's done, then they're gone for four months in the field training program. If we get somebody, uh, as we just did recently, who was a, 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 came from the Sheriff's Department, actually, and worked there for a couple of years, had a separation of service, and then wanted to come back into law enforcement, their, their, their training cycle was extremely short because they were very familiar with the area, they were very familiar with most of our procedures and so forth, and so that was real short. The worst case scenario is if we have to go and hire new people and put them through the academy. Because if you told me today that I could hire somebody, I can't hire them until July 1st, and then you won't see them for nine months, probably, well, 10 months, all uh, until April of the following year. So that learning curve is very long. Question? Yeah, I just wanted to throw in my few cents worth. I just wanted to uh, pretty much agree with what the council said relative to the opportunity we fa we're faced with, and hopefully uh, we'll be uh, pleasantly surprised and, and funded through the grant. You know, I think uh, I'm an optimist, but I agree. I think it's probably the best timing in terms of the grant for us because we've gone through some lean years. We've had to stretch our budgets, and I agree with Councilwoman uh, Rooney that probably the budget will dictate how it's implemented. Absolutely. And we'll see how that works out. But, you know, I think my emphasis, I feel, that's important in this grant is the community policing and then the focus on the, the school-based uh, policing through our community resource officers. So I'm looking forward to that. And I think you'll hopefully give us uh, updates as we get closer to yes. the, the funding deadline and, and how we fare. So. Yeah, I, I will let you know, and I, and I will caution everybody, these grants are very competitive. They're very difficult to obtain. A lot of times they go to more urban areas. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah. I can only be optimistic. Right. Mayor, if I could real quick, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as funding the officers in the middle of a fiscal year, most years we have a significant amount of savings from salary savings from officers that leave during the middle of the year. Either they go to another job, they retire. That's probably what we would look at to fund these positions if they were to come on in the middle of the fiscal years. Look at salary savings from other positions, other people that have left during that same time. Correct. Uh, actually, it's a good point. Uh, so, for example, this year my budget was about $10.8 million, $10.7 million, and I did not use uh, anywhere from 6 to 7% of that's being returned. So that's about 680 to $750,000 that's coming back. So there's always, there always seems to be some extra money laying around. Huh. <laughs> I think you're... Uh Save us about a half a million dollars on this one. Yeah, this is about a 60-40 split, 60% government, uh, federal government, 40% local. Good. Yes. I'd, I'll make the motion. Motion to approve the submittal of a grant application for U.S. Department of Justice Office of Community Oriented Policing 2017 COPS Hiring Program Application Number CFDA 16.710 requiring at a minimum a $463,259.76 in matching non-federal funds. Mayor, I'd like to second that motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, June, we, uh, would you set the vote? We have a motion and a second. Councilman Mallory? Yes. Thank yes. you. Okay. And that passes, Mayor. Chief, go for it. Thank you very much. And I just want to be clear, Councilman Rooney, did you say that you wanted the council to see a copy of the grant application? Oh, okay. I'd, I'd be think, more than happy to send, send it, especially if you have insomnia, you're more than happy to read through it. <laughs> I think before you sit down, I think Laura Lee has the uh, vice mayor. Has the... Well, I thought you might like to join me in honoring our Boy Scouts here and thank them for being here. We very much appreciate you here. Are you working on a badge? Well, we hope you 
weren't really bored. We hope you were able to learn something. And you're always welcome here and tell the other members of your troop that they are welcome as well. You're welcome. I agree. Future police officers. Okay. Now I move on to uh, unscheduled comments from the public. These, uh, anyone wishing to address the council need not request permission in advance. Any such remark shall be addressed to the council as a whole and not to any member thereof. And such remarks shall be limited to five minutes unless additional time is granted. And it looks like you're ready to make a comment. It's good to see you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you and good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, my name is Susan Brenton. I'm the executive director for the Arizona Alarm Association. We represent the alarm companies throughout the state. Let me tell you a little bit about our association first. We have a public safety committee, which is made up of representatives from police departments across the state. We have worked with many communities throughout the state on their alarm ordinances. As you've probably heard, we are opposed to the police department's proposed alarm ordinance, which states that if your alarm goes off, unless you somehow verify that there really has been a break-in, um, no one's going to respond to it. The police are not responding. And verification means that I have to hire an alarm or I have to hire a security guard to go to that home or office, or like in the case of a lot of individuals, they would probably individually get in their car at 2 a.m. and go to their office and hope that whoever was in there is left. Um, or maybe a neighbor calls in to the police or something. This is very bad, especially if someone breaks into your home in the middle of the night. One alarm goes off, it's unverified, and you're home asleep. Um, our association has not been successful so far in trying to arrange meetings with each of you because we'd like to explain why verified response is used in such a very small, minute fraction of police to, of the cities and the alternatives that you could use to reduce the false alarms. And those alternatives, in fact, cities have found that they, pub they really do punish those 15% of the people that cause 85% of the false alarms. Rather, 15% causing 85% of your false alarms. Rather than punishing everyone, um, whether they're a responsible user or not. I hope that each of you will agree within the next week or so to meet with us and hear the alternatives that will best serve your constituents. I would like to, you each to be informed before you make a decision on this about how the escalating fines, offering no response after a specific number of false alarms happens each year unless the alarm user fixes the problem, and how making an alarm monitoring station use what we call enhanced confirmation call techniques do work to reduce false alarms. Before you, know, before you vote on this important issue, I just think you need to learn the alternatives. And I hope that you'll be there on Tuesday at the police department's town hall on this event. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if that's allowed during this comment. I'll allow a question. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question. And because this is... <clears throat> an emotional situation as well as legal. Um, I really did a lot of reading and a lot of research. And I do have a question that I intended to ask on Tuesday, but I'll ask it now. Why do you validate putting the responsibility for a service you provide on our law enforcement? I just have a real problem with that. You provide the service. Citizens pay you for the service. And I'm very concerned at the burden that this has been placed on police departments. So I want to know why you're willing uh, to not take that responsibility for the service you provide. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, let me explain that um, the service we provide is the actual alarm system and alarm monitoring. That's what the residents pay us for. We monitor their alarm. Like with the enhanced call verification, which many cities have adopted now, 
what will happen is when an alarm goes off and the alarm monitoring station receives the call that, say, my home alarm's gone off, before they're even going to call the police, they're going to try to call me, they're going to try to call, they're going to try to make two calls to get hold of someone first. That right there is reduced about 40%, 30, 35 to 40% of false alarms. Um, we just don't provide security. We provide the alarm and monitoring the alarm. Those are the services that we provide. And in fact, um, you know, in many of the communities, I've heard, I know in my community, when there is a police car on the street, regardless of why they're there, I feel safer and I'm glad to see that they know about my neighborhood, you know. Mayor Skoog, this is going to be on the agenda for next week's work study. I think that would be a, a more appropriate time to discuss it. We can have this two-way conversation. Okay. I think, and I think that's correct. We, we'll uh, save it for next work study. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate that. Well, thank you, and I hope to get in to see each of you. Thanks. Good to see, see you. Thank you. Okay. Any other from the public care to comment? If not... Yes. Here's oh, I'm this. sorry. Come on up. Could you uh, uh, pull the microphone down just a little bit? Right here. Thank you. Um, I'm a terrible speaker, and I'm going to try to read this, and the words are going to go all over the paper. <laughs> if you would introduce yourself first. Well, uh, my name is Pam Algrove. I'm a resident and homeowner in the neighborhood. And I live across the field from where you are right now. And the reason why I'm here is because we were totally invaded with the little, and I brought them, I brought some pictures, and the little rolling things that are all over the place, they're called squirrel tails or elmus, box elmus, tails, whatever, uh, they call them a squirrel tail or something, they have the plant, but we had probably twenty to 50,000 show up on our property over the weekend of June 5th, I believe it was, uh, when the high winds came up, and I went, I've been cleaning them up. It took me like 12 days to even just get them out of there. They're in everything, and I have pictures that I brought for you. And I'd like to know if there's anything that can be done. I even brought a CD. I even took pictures on Monday morning of the steps. Can I bring, give these to somebody here? Because it is, it's turned out to be a real problem. Yeah, you give it to our town uh, manager and he'll. Are these uh, for us to keep? I'll, try, I'll yeah. try to read what I have, but basically, I don't even need to know if I need to read that part. But they, I mean, they just came in in droves and they looked like little aliens marching down the roads and they climbed fences and they blew in the air and they rolled around and they just were absolutely everywhere. I've never seen them like that. I think it's because, well, I went down to the, to the to code enforcement on Monday, the following Monday, and they said that oh, they're, they're coming from the field on Glassford Hill in Long Look, mm -hmm. and they're all over here, too. I know they are. I have a picture in there of them being everywhere. They're rolling around everywhere. And I think he told me that the property is owned by Fane, uh, whatever they call themselves, Fane, uh, enterprises or something. And anyway, I went down and talked with talked with code enforcement. They said that there's no requirements for open land within city limits to do anything else but just mow it, mow the property in ten feet in along the roadsides. But it doesn't. I mean, if tumbleweeds travel off of their property or these things fly off of everything, then they're not responsible for it. And I thought that's it's very unfair to our neighborhood. And if you look at the pictures, you'll see what I mean, because they are literally everywhere. I'm not saying a couple. I always get 100 to 200, but I mean, there were 20 to 50,000 of them that came in when those high winds came up this year. And I think it's because 
Fane always brings the cattle in around April or May. And I think they usually eat up all of that. Well, this year they have, they're working on the road in Long Look, and they had the fence down so that the cattle didn't come in. I don't know if that's it. I don't know what it is. But uh, code enforcement told me there's no requirements for them to do anything. And I said, well, then I'm not going to clean it up because I was very upset. He says, well, if you don't, then you'll get fined, cited, and fined for not cleaning them up. And I thought, that's kind of unfair. It came from somebody else's property onto mine, and there's no recourse for me. And it just doesn't seem right. Tumbleweeds used to be a problem. They're not that much of a problem anymore. I called a couple years ago, and they've controlled that. They used to line the fence up on that side. Anyway, I went over and I talked with Mr. Jeff Wasselwitz over at Fane Properties, and he came over and saw it, and he, he was astounded to see how many there were. He was he just looked, he, he says, well, I'll get back to you. Of course, his get back to you was, well, there's really nothing that we, that we um, can do because they're not required to do anything. Now, as a homeowner, I have to keep my property up or I get cited if I've got weeds or trash or whatever out there, if it's something that I do destroys another neighbor's property, I'm responsible. Vacant land within city limits, there needs to be some kind of rulings. There needs to be some kind of something that says within city limits, they, they have to maintain it, either mow it down, till it, keep cattle on it, do a controlled burn, something, because it's, I know I, if you live in Prescott Valley and you live within this area, I know you have them on your property. I know you do. I know they've rolled in, they rolled down, I know you've seen them rolling down the streets. I know you know what I'm talking about, but I've never seen them like this. And it, they, you can't pick them up, you try to smash them, they don't smash, you can't put them in the trash can. Uh, Mr. Wasowitz sent two guys over to help me clean up because he felt sorry for me and he and they couldn't get him in the trash cans they brought two trash cans and a rake and then they ended up beating him up with a rake and now I've got the little seed pods everywhere they're stuck in my dog they're I mean they're they're everywhere they're, and they bailed after about two hours they never came back and I thought well okay you know and I spent almost 12 days trying to clean this up and when the wind shifts they're coming back in because the ones that roll down the street are now back. And I'm not talking a few or I wouldn't be here because every year I clean up, you know, 100, 150 of them just because they're there like a, a leaf. But they're not like a leaf. You can't vacuum them up. You can't, they're, they are native to this area. But I guess my point is that anything within city limits ought to have some kind of ruling. I, I have to be responsible. And Mr. Wasowitz told me, he says, you know, I said, you know, it's destroying our neighborhood. He says, well, I said, that doesn't seem right. He says, well, our property was here first. And you put your residence right up next to our property. So, oh, well. And they don't have any, there is no recourse. There is no, nothing that they have to do except for keep, I think, keep a fence up and mow it 10 feet around, 10 feet in. And that's my, that's my beef. And it, I, I think it should go for not just that property. Uh, even Walmart, the other day I was over there. Look at their vegetables. You see those things sitting up on the shelves, three or four feet high. You see them down under the, they're everywhere. They're just everywhere. And if it had been controlled, that wouldn't be there. That's trash. That's like if I take, if I take a bunch of uh, refuse to the dump, I have to tarp my load or I'll get cited or I'll get fined, I'll get a ticket for not tarping my load. How can that property not be responsible for the, the debris that comes off of it? It just, it just does not seem fair to me or to the community. And my neighbors across the street cried, I guess the people next door that clogged up their filters and a few are one thing, I understand that, but these, and these are different. You can't pick them up and throw them away like a leaf. You can't vacuum them up like a leaf. They, they clog up your shop vacs. They clog up every. They're they're different. They're, they're more than a nuisance. And they they're all stuck in my. I have Shih Tzus with long hair. So anyway, that's, that's my thing. I'd like to see that they're. I don't know how to do it, but there's got to be some kind of a regulation put into effect 
to control rural or vacant land within city limits. I understand out away that's normal, but within the city limits, there ought to be some kind of control. That. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Pam. I appreciate that. Is there do I is there something else that I can do to make this? I mean, like if you have an additional question, you like may that? we Pardon? could you could, could refer you to a town manager. I'm sorry. So refer, we'd like to refer you to town manager if you have further questions on it. There's some special situations here faced with so if you could talk to a town manager maybe in the coming week either uh, I don't ryan know judy. why but i'm not who do i talk to sir? town manager ryan judy or uh, larry tarkowski ryan judy is here he's our deputy oh, okay. town manager and i would talk to him about something i think that like would be, be the best uh, i don't know if i should do like a petition i i have no idea what to well, do i just know that i'm so frustrated and yeah, I can, still rolling in i mean i still have maybe 30 40 a day come in yeah, no, we, we can understand your frustration. Mary, you wanna, do you want to? Okay. Oh, I was just going to say that coming here tonight was perfectly fine. It's the start of something. Okay. And I know that Ryan has pictures, and I'm sure that we will reach out to you. Okay. Do uh, you have her number? To, today, or, or you want, do you want a copy, copy of the letter? And, and I've got your name here. And I think I wrote it on that. Yep. I have uh, a copy of what I wrote. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank Anyone you. Anyone else care to make any comments? If not, we'll move on to the next item, number 10. That's my we need a motion to convene into executive session to receive uh, legal advice pertaining to banners and inflatable usages. Executive session to be scheduled pursuant to re the revised statute number 3841030A3, which allows consultation with the attorney of the public body. Anyone care to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second the motion. We have a second. June, could you set the uh, vote? And Councilmember Miller? Yes. Thank you. And that passes. Okay. Well, we're going to recess for a little bit, and then we'll go into executive session.